All right. Hey, we've got a really big crowd today and a lot of articles to go through. Many of them, thankfully, are short, but this is the May uh, 20th, 2021, Oregon Poison Center Journal Club. And uh, today's theme is new uses for old antidotes. Um, due to shortages and some new understanding of physiology and some innovation, um, people are starting to repurpose things that we've had around for years uh, to new uses. Um, many of these cases are anecdotal at best, and so none of these are approved uses. So if you're listening out there, um, do not try this until more data is, is, is available on pretty much all of these, but we can chat as we go through. We're going to talk about five different drugs today or drug classes today, each used for different purposes. Um, and to start off, we're going to start with, as we usually do, the oldest of the articles. Um, there was actually a 40 year gap between anything being written about this initially and then more recently a couple of things on what to do about anticholinergic delirium or central anticholinergic syndrome. So with that, I will turn it over to our OHSU emergency medicine uh, resident, Natalie. A moment, I need to set up on my computer. <laughs> Just a second, please. <laughs> Good, I see we have almost everyone joining us. Almost here. <laughs> I was in a, there was a different meeting that over kind of overflew <laughs> into my time. All right, so uh, the first article that I will be discussing is the article one reversal of central anticholinergic syndrome by galanthamine. It was um, released in 1977. Uh, so, kind of a brief intro, galanthamine is naturally occur occurring anticholinesterase. It's extracted from snowdrop flower in Bulgaria. Uh, it inhibits both muscle and brain cholinesterases and uh, crosses blood-brain barrier very well. Uh, their hypothesis was that galanthamine might reverse the central anticholinergic syndrome um, produced by scopolamine and other related compounds. So, by four methods uh, for this particular study, they had 10 healthy male medical students uh, who received 2 milligrams of scopolamine hydrobromide IV. Uh, in which a central effects were observed almost 10 minutes uh, up to 40 minutes with peak effect of drowsiness, disorientation, and hallucinations. Um, at 40 minutes, uh, the 0.5 milligrams per kg, per kg of galanthamine hydrobromide was given IV. And um, basically, reversal of the central symptoms was seen within 10 minutes in all of the subjects. Um, they also interestingly follow subjects with an EEG, two of them only. Uh, so kind of for results of this particular study, um, in all volunteers that received the scopolamine dosage, uh, drowsiness was noted in, uh, with peak effects in 30 to 40 minutes. Um, again, the galanthamine uh, effects were seen in 5 to 10 minutes after administration, and patients were completely awake in 30 minutes. Um, the symptoms that were observed initially with scopolamine were the typical increased heart rate, um, and then galanthamine reversed it to uh, as high as 110 to 130, and galanthamine reversed it back to 60s and 70s uh, by the um, basically peak administration of the galanthamine. Uh, the um, study subjects we, we had complete relapse of drowsiness. Um, the EEG and the two awake volunteers. Um, Prior to administration of scopolamine was showing a normal background 9 to 11 hertz alpha rhythm. And then within 10 minutes of the scopolamine, they noted changes that uh, with the replacement of alpha rhythm by a disorganized rhythm. And then promptly after galanthamine administration, we saw a normal EEG pattern again. Um, so again, the galanthamine is just another tertiary amine anticholinesterase and can also effectively reverse central anticholinergic syndrome. Um, it acts in the midbrain reticulum, and typically it looks like pisostigmine has been clinically used for reversal of central anticholinergic syndrome. 
Um, but the problem with that is the duration of its effect is usually short. Um, and patient subjects usually re uh, become relapsed to drowsiness pretty quickly. Whereas when galanthamine, it was a long lasting effect, though as far as how long it lasted, the reports were, or it wasn't really reported in this article. Um, for the second one, it was the article of, do we want to discuss the first one or should I just go well, through all of them? I'll just make, you know, one sentence a kind of segue is that that article came out and for years we always pointed it as, even though galanthamine never got released in the United States or pretty much anywhere else, um, there was alternatives to physostigmine, and we always ran into cases where physostigmine was in short supply. Currently, right now, in the United States, physostigmine is, is barely available unless you've stockpiled it somewhere. So it took up to this year, 40 plus years later, for a couple of letters to come out, one of which is, is ours, to talk about other options for anticholinergic delirium. So you can go ahead with those next, those two letters then. So the, the letter, the article two is the uh, from year 2020, uh, titled Rivastigmine for the Treatment of Anticholinergic Delirium Following Severe um, Procyclidine Intoxication. Uh, evidence in this case, particularly <laughs> in six patients that had scopolamine related psychosis, um, transdermal rivastigmine reduced their psychiatric symptoms. Um, and they presented a case that improved it with just 1.5 milligrams of erostigmine. So the case itself uh, was a 35-year-old male who ingested 30, 300 tablets of procyclidine, 5 milligram. Uh, currently, he was also on haloperidol, risperidone, a couple of benzos, and had recently uh, been prescribed the procyclidine for the extrapyramidal effects. On presentation, he was a GCS of eight, cyanotic. He was urgently intubated. Uh, he was tachycardic and hypertensive, as well as febrile at 38.2. And the anticholinergic symptoms that were noted were hyper hyperthermia, mydriasis, flushed red skin. Uh, he was initially sedated with propofol and fentanyl and received fluids. EKG was with normal sinus rhythm and a right bundle branch block. After intubation, he did receive charcoal and was transported to the ICU, uh, but and extubated in the next morning and then showed signs of agitation and hallucination. At this time, uh, they had diagnosed the anticholinergic toxicity and physostigmine was not available at the, at the hospital. So what they had reverted to was the 1.5 milligram of rivastigmine that was started twice daily. Uh, they noted rapid decline in agitation over six hours uh, with return to baseline in 24 hours. Um, this treatment was continued for seven days, uh, just basically based on the amount of procyclidine that he had taken. Uh, conclusion, a conclusion of this letter argues that rivastigmine 1.5 milligrams is useful for treatment um, of anticholinergic syndrome and it gives a long acting profile uh, or has a long acting profile, it is uh, much more specific for CNS and has less peripheral toxicity compared to the physostigmine. And we have the third letter, which was written by our very own Dr. Hughes and Dr. Thompson in February 2021. Um, this one is titled, A Letter in Response to Rivastigmine for the Treatment of Anticholinergic Delirium Following Severe Procycline in Intoxication. So, um, let me see. So, for this one, we have a case of a 36-year-old woman. Um, she was brought in by EMS after being found unresponsive at a bus stop. Uh, she did have an empty bottle of diphenhydramine next to her. Um, her initial vital signs were within normal limits. However, upon arrival, she became agitated, restless, um, and mumbling incoherently. Uh, she was also on physical exam, noted to have mydriatic pu uh, pupils, horizontal nystagmus, and dry skin. Her vitals were notable for tachycardia of 120, um, and she, her restlessness and agitation gave her a RAS score of plus 3. Uh, at that time, she was administered one milligram of lorazepam intramuscularly, and then followed by another one intravenously, with minimal clinical improvement. So the toxicology team at that time had recommended physostigmine, um, but due to national US shortage, it was unavailable. Um, so instead they had uh, recommended rivastigmine three milligrams PO. 
And this was followed by two additional three milligram oral doses over the course of two hours. On reevaluation, the, the patient still remains slightly confused in two hours, but showed significant improvement in her RAS score to. And <laughs> there's calls from everywhere. And then over the following 24 hours, the patient received an additional three milligram uh, rivastigmine PO dose for a total of 12 milligrams with complete resolution of her symptoms. Um, she had experienced no adverse effects with this symptom or with this treatment. Um, and then I think kind of the bottom line of this of this letter, I think is very important. So rivastigmine itself is not commonly used as a antidote to a cholinergic toxicity, but it looks like it has very few or if any uh, side effects from its administration and it, it lo it's long acting, it's effective. You can take a PO and um, kind of the scary side effects of physostigmine of low heart rates and VFib and um, kind of a cardiac arrest that we can see from it are not seen with rivastigmine treatment. Um, so, again, pre preferred, especially for prolonged delirium, uh, that, like in this case, would be the rivastigmine agent. Um, and I think that was a very interesting new finding for me, too. Yeah, thanks. No, I, it's there's not much in the literature. In fact, I, I believe this is all that there is in literature currently. Um, I know, and if people are listening out there and, and even years to come right in, I, I, I'd be curious to hear what the uh, doses they use, the regimen they use, we are, we're all just trying to figure that out. But uh, up to what's a standard maximum daily dose of rupestigmine of six milligrams twice a day seem to be safe. Um, and at least based on a RAS score, which is probably the best we have for evaluating it, it seemed to work. So we will see more of this, I am sure in the future, but a perhaps new uh, antidote born of the uh, need because of the lack of uh, physostigmine in the US. I'm gonna change gears a little bit. Um, if anyone has any comments on rivastigmine, we'll certainly say that now, or I would change gears to yet another antidote, which is slowly creeping uh, back for new indications, which is hydroxycobalamin um, itself is, is not that old. It's been just recently in the last dozen years or so been used for rare cases of cyanide poisoning, but now it's getting repurposed based on some of the cardiovascular anesthesia surgery literature for possible other uses. So we'll also have our OHSU emergency medicine resident Ryan tell us about a couple of articles there. Right. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be presenting two articles. Um, the first is titled Rescue of Nemotipine Induced Refractory Phasoplegia with Hydroxycobalamin in a Subarachnoid Hemorrhage. Um, this is from the journal Critical Care Explorations, published um, back in 2020. And just by way of review, um, background information on this subject. Um, as we all know, nemotipine is um, given in the setting of um, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, primarily to reduce basal spasm related um, morbidity and mortality. Um, however, there are case reports where nemotipine administration, um, and there's one case series of four patients that describes um, refractory basoplegia following nemotipine administration, and in those um, case reports, it was described that um, two agents um, can serve as um, effective rescue therapies, um, the first being methylene blue, and then this article highlights the use of hydroxylcobalamin um, to, to treat these patients. So in this case, there's an 84-year-old um, male who has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, he is on hormonal therapy for concurrent prostate adenocarcinoma. He had no prior stroke or cerebral hemorrhage. However, he was found down um, at an outside hospital with a GCS of three. A CT had revealed um, a left uh, cisternal subarachnoid bleed. Um, and then in addition, he had um, bilateral um, subdural hematomas as well. A CT angiogram demonstrated a left 
uh, intracerebral artery aneurysm, um, and it was thought that this aneurysm likely ruptured, causing his clinical presentation. Um, unfortunately, because of his age and poor neurologic examination, he was not considered for um, neurosurgical evaluation or clipping, um, and he was managed medically. He was started on a labetalol infusion to maintain his MAP around 70 to 90. And then on day three, nimodipine was started. Um, and then 15 minutes after administration of 60 milligrams of nimodipine, he became um, uh, profoundly hypotensive with um, MAPs in the 50s. Um, and his labetalol infusion had been stopped several hours beforehand, so it was thought that this was due to the nimodipine administration. He was given a liter of crystalloid um, vasopressors um, for his hypotension, um, but this proved to be refractory to that. Um, he was actually on escalated to triple vasopressor therapy of norepi, um, phenylephrine, as well as epinephrine. He was also given two grams of calcium gluconate um, with minimal benefit. Um, thankfully, his ABG looked okay. Um, but about 30 minutes into this, it was um, he was started on um, uh, hydroxycobalamin, and within several minutes, his um, blood pressure improved. Um, just to rule out other potential etiologies, they did do a um, point of care ultrasound um, to exclude other causes of hypotension. His echo demonstrated um, normal contractility or hyperdynamic. Um, contractility. Um, his IVC demonstrated um, that he was unlikely to be volume responsive. Um, and then he had bilateral lung sliding, um, therefore it's felt that he wasn't having any pneumothorax. And then they also did ocular ultrasound, ultrasounds, which did not show um, any optic disc. Um, the optic nerve sheets were um, less than five millimeters, which argued against the intracranial, elevated intracranial pressure. So in their discussion, they proposed an algorithm um, where in addition to methylene blue, or um, instead of methylene blue, um, you could potentially use hydroxycobalamin for refractory um, uh, vasoplegia in the setting of nimodipine use. Um, methylene blue, while it does have its uses, has several contraindications, including um, risk of serotonin syndrome if um, it's given in concurrent um, with other serotonergic agents. Um, there's also risk of hemolysis with G6PD deficiency, so that the, the, um, the medication that they um, describe is hydroxyfolamine at a dose of 5 to 10 grams IV over 15 minutes. Um, to to see if that helps to improve the patient's um, refractory vasoplegia. And, and the way that it's thought that both of these medications work is um, onimodipine is primarily a um, calcium channel antagonist. It can lead to a release of nitric oxide um, and both hydroxycobalamin and methylene blue um, can serve as nitric oxide scavengers, um, which can um, improve their vasoplegia. Um, that's essentially the gist of the article. Um, if anybody has any comments or questions about but, that. Yeah, I thought it was good that, you know, they did what I, I think we might do in the urgency department when someone drops their blood pressure and we don't know why they used ultrasound to, uh, to effectively rule out other causes and really narrowed it down to most likely related to the calcium channel blocker. This wasn't really a calcium channel block or overdose, but we've seen anecdotally and unpublished people using uh, hydroxycobalamin for um, massive calcium channel blocker overdose with a similar vasoplegia, refractory hypotension that requires multiple vasopressors. Um, I threw in as accompanying editorial, just talking about some of the downsides of both uh, hydroxycobalamin, um, just to kind of cover all bases here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so the second article that I had reviewed um, was titled Cobalt Blues, a new complication of hydroxycobalamin therapy for vasopressor-resistant vasoplegia in patients treated with CRRT. 
This is from their journal of cardiothoracic, cardiothoracic and vascular anesthesia back in 2019. Um, just some background information. So as the name hydroxycobalamin suggests, there's actually a cobalt um, atom. Um, and sometimes, um, and historically, um, cobalt blue can lead to a syndrome of toxicity um, of dilated cardiomyopathy, vision and hearing deficits, tinnitus, paresthesias, and polyneuropathy, optic nerve atrophy, um, as well as cognitive dysfunction and hypothyroidism. And initially, it was seen in, in patients who had um, occupational or chronic exposures from industrial settings, such as um, paint or ceramic manufacturing or metal, product, um, or metal production. So this case goes on to describe primarily the side effects of hydroxyphalamin use. Um, there's, um, in almost all patients, there's chromaturia, um, where they have a red or orange um, discoloration of their urine, um, and that will falsely elevate the pH, protein, and glucose. Their plasma also becomes red tinged, and this throws off many hematologic studies um, such as um, leading to elevated hemoglobin and basophil levels. Um, platelet and leukocyte counts are generally unaffected, but additionally, this can throw off chemistry tests as well, such as the glucose, creatinine, bilirubin, triglycerides, cholesterol, LFTs, albumin um, studies. It also throws off coaximetry um, studies, leading to inaccurate measurements of methane. Uh, methemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin levels and falsely reduces the um, arterial oxygen saturation values. And then um, quite alarmingly, um, it, in patients undergoing hemodialysis, it can lead to a false blood leak alarm um, that can inadvertently cause um, hemodialysis devices to shut down. And in some case reports, this has led to the death of several patients. Um, and then there are other potential side effects, hypokalemia after hydroxycobalamin um, administration um, in patients with megaloblastic anemia um, because this uh, results in the uptake of potassium from newly formed blood cells. And then they can also get oxalate crystals um, to develop in the urine, which um, is thought may sometimes lead to renal failure as well. Um, in this journal, they have a case report of um, a patient who um, was being treated at the Mayo Clinic. He was a NYHA um, class four heart failure, as well as end-stage renal disease patient who was undergoing um, a um, heart and kidney um, transplant. Um, however, um, postoperatively, he developed vasopressor-resistant vasoplegia um, and then was started on hydroxycobalamin as well as CRRT. Um, his hydroxycobalamin initially improved the, um, the vasoplegia, however, it then became persistent and he received two additional doses of hydroxycobalamin, um, so three total doses. Um, he then underwent um, uh, chronic nutritional support and had a trace metals analysis incidentally, which noted that his cobalt levels were 307 and the normal reference range is um, less than one um, nanogram per milliliter. Um, he also had um, markedly elevated B12 concentrations of 644,000 nanograms per milliliter. Um, unfortunately, the patient died as a result of um, multi-organ failure and, um, you know, despite the care that he received. Um, and it was later found out that the CRT machine was unable to remove um, these cobalt um, um, atoms from, uh, you know, using them from his blood, leading to this potential toxicity. He did not have any, like, overt signs. He, he basically, at one point, demonstrated bilateral or um, extremity neuropathic pain, but they were unable to draw this correlation to the elevated um, cobalt levels until the, the toxic metals came back. Um, so this is just another um, potential complication that has not really been um, evaluated before that patients on CRT 
might develop um, toxic levels of cobalt and B12 um, following the administration of uh, multiple doses of hydroxycobalamin. Yeah, we've we've had it at occasional sporadic cases where people have suggested it to us from other services, especially surgery uh, services, where I think it's in more in their literature than ours, but increasingly in the medical literature. But I, I think it just points out to be aware of that the big risk is you have to be aware of what it does to the dialysis machine because it turns everything red and the dialysis machine detects it as a blood leak. Whether or not these elevated cobalt levels mean anything transiently, very hard to say. Um, you're gonna have to, you know, look at these patients if they're resuscitated and survive. Do they have the typical cobalt toxicity in their heart with a uh, heart failure or, th or thyroid problems, a hearing or vision loss? Um, many of these things can't be determined until the patient's back to their baseline or back to post resuscitative care. But it comes up from time to time, and again, not approved for this use, but it increasingly we hear of cases being used off off label. Thanks. We're going to change gears a little bit. The next uh, group of articles for the next three, four, five sections, we're going to talk about something we do see more of, and we'll start out kind of building the case from animal models up to human models. So to tell us about a couple of animal models, uh, we have our visiting. You know, uh, University of British Columbia uh, emergency medicine resident Bradley. So, why don't you tell us about your two studies? Perfect, sounds good. Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, my studies are animal studies, um, and they are both looking at uh, the use of methylene blue for amlodipo uh, amlodipine toxicity. Uh, the first one is a study of efficacy of methylene blue in a uh, murine model of amlodipine overdose, and that was in the uh, American Journal of Emergency Medicine. And then the uh, second one that I'm going to go over is the effect of methylene blue on a, a porcine model of amlodipine toxicity. So, uh, mice and then pigs. Um, just some background for both of them because they're covering the same topic. Um, obviously, calcium channel blocker overdoses have significant morbidity and mortality, and they're the leading cause of kind of cardiovascular medication related overdose. Um, there's 58 deaths in 2018, um, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Basically, they cause peripheral vascular dilation, and then at high doses, they cause cardiac dysfunction. And then lodipine is a dihydropyridine, and it causes vasodilation by releasing nitric oxide, um, as well as has some calcium channel blockade, obviously. And it's got a really long half-life, 40 to 50 hours, and it's got some delayed toxicity, making its toxicity quite complicated. And so the treatment has conventionally been fluids, calcium, vasopressors, and you know through this rotation we've discussed a couple times high dose insulin, intralipid or ECMO. But there's still a question of the best uh, modality of treatment. Um, the high dose insulin show, shows uh, improvement of cardiac output, perfusion, and mortality in animal models. And then uh, its you know its goal is to improve cardiac function. But there's also a need to improve the systemic vascular resistance in these toxicities. So, given amlodipine's action of releasing that nitric oxide, the authors of both papers proposed that nitric oxide scavenging therapy would have uh, would be a potential treatment. So, methylene blue inhibits nitric oxide directly, as well as inhibits nitric oxide production. It does this by inhibiting the nitric oxide synthase and guanylate cyclase. Um, it has been reported to treat amlodipine overdose in human cases in rat models. However, it's not quite standard of care and um, they wanted to do some more isolated tests. So that first paper, um, again, is uh, the, the MICE trial. And this was a randomized control study of methylene blue in mice that were poisoned with oral amlodipine. Um, there were 12 mice, six in the control group and six in the methylene blue group. The primary outcome was survival at two hours. And then secondary outcomes were differences in cardiac parameters that were measured between the two groups. So the mice were anesthetized. Um, they did some mini bedside echo um, on the mice. Um, they looked at the left ventricle via our standard long axis and short axis, and they looked at things like LV dimensions, volumes, wall thickness, and they calculated the LV mass and ejection fraction. The mice were then give 90, given 90 milligrams per kilogram of amlodipine orally, 
And then five, uh, five minutes after this, they either received methylene blue dosed at 20 milligrams per kilogram or just a vehicle solution as a control um, therapy. And that was uh, injected intraperitoneal. The mice had constant monitoring and uh, the cardiac parameters were evaluated every 15 minutes. And then they did do echo uh, echocardiography performed every 15 minutes up to two hours, um, all done by one very experienced echo uh, tech. And lodipine um, delivery showed significant reduction in LV uh, EF, uh, as well as reduced fractional shortening, reduced stroke volume, and reduced cardiac output. Um, all the animals at the end were euthanized, and then they looked at the hearts for analysis later. So uh, the results, three out of the six mice, or 50% of the mice, survived in the control group who just got the vehicle solution. And then five out of the six mice, or 83%, survived in the methylene blue group. Uh, so in the control group, two of the animals died within 45 minutes of amlodipine delivery, and then another died out after an hour and a half. Um, despite, you know, it being three out of six and then five out of six and an 83% versus 50, the survival curves are actually not statistically significant, but there obviously is two extra mice living there. Um, uh, heart rate at baseline, all the mite had similar heart rates. Uh, however, the control group ended up having a lower heart rate compared to methylene blue after amlodipine. Um, and they, again, they looked at the cardiac function, which was super interesting. So the ejection fraction was measured as a change from the mouse's baseline um, to after they got the amlodipine. And there was a significantly uh, statistically significant change between the two groups. The methylene blue group dis uh, displayed a higher EF after two hours compared to the control group. Um, and uh, out of interest, like the EF percentage change in the control group was 86%. So their EF dropped 86% and it was only 42% in the methylene blue group. So obviously amlodipine has a pretty profound effect on the ejection fraction and you know, potentially methylene blue uh, helped in that situation. Um, with regards to the cardiac contractility, they used the fractional shortening, which measures the percent of change in the LV chamber dimension with systolic contraction was used. And uh, methylene blue, again, displayed better LV fractional shortening compared to the control group. Uh, so uh, essentially methylene blue really blunted the kind of decline in cardiac output or helped with cardiac output, which is interesting. Um, just for a quick discussion of that paper, the authors proposed that methylene blue either directly affects the heart rate and prevents bradycardia or the methylene blue preserves the heart rate just as like an indirect uh, effect by blunting vasodilation. Um, there were some uh, limitations. Uh, they're unable to get blood pressures. I think it's obviously difficult given the, the animal model, and um, their blood pressures were too low really to get to get readings the normal way they do by using tail tail blood pressure cuffs. Um, these results are kind of in keeping with previous studies that demonstrate improved he hemodynamics, but no improve on survival or no effect on survival rather. Um, but this may be kind of the first study to really show the effect of methylene blue on actual cardiac function. Um, obviously, they're still needing more data. Uh, so that's paper number one. I don't know if anyone wants to comment that one, or we can jump right into the. Uh, no, we'll just go right into the second one. Perfect. Sounds that's good. One, yeah. So second one is uh, very similar. Um, in this case, though, they wanted to compare uh, methylene blue to norepi, um, and this was on pig models. So they had fifteen uh, pigs, which again were sedated and anesthetized. Um, they had tr tracheostomies and put on a ventilator and then had continuous cardiac uh, monitoring. They went to like full cardiac OR. They put a Swan's a Swan Gans catheter. They put Fem art line um, to measure BP and, and pH and do regular blood work. And basically once they got the pigs on the monitors, they stabilized them for 30 minutes and then they just did constant hemodynamic monitoring. Um, blood drawn was, uh, blood was drawn every 30 minutes. So again, they, they gave them, uh, this time they gave them an amlodipine infusion though, and they went 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per hour. And then they ramped it up every 30 minutes by that same interval. And the idea was to kind of mimic an oral overdose where you're getting more of like a sustained release and building up. And it was to stimulate a pretty severe toxicity in this case. Um, they suggested that they figured the maximum or the toxicity would kind of occur at 0.75 milligrams per kilogram per hour. So about 60 minutes into the infusion. And so they uh, started their treatment of uh, methylene blue or norepi at 70 minutes. So just after they kind of figured that toxic dose would be uh, pertinent. So uh, at 70 minutes, each uh, pig got 20 cc's per kilogram of normal saline, just a bolus. And then they were randomized to either receive methylene blue or uh, norepi. 
Um, this uh, was assigned randomly prior to the start of each experiment. Um, the guy who, or the, sorry, the investigator who was preparing the drugs was blinded to the pig's hemodynamics, and then the investigator monitoring the hemodynamics was blinded to the uh, intervention, the drugs that the pig received. Uh, methylene blue was given as a two milligram per kilogram bolus and then uh, started as an infusion. And then norepi, they started at 0.1 uh, mics per, per minute, and then they, they titrated up to a map of 55 and uh, a max dose of 0.5 mics per kilogram per minute. Um, they ran the they ran the experiment till uh, five hours after the start of amlodipine infusion or death, whichever came first. And then obviously all the animals are euthanized in the end. Um, the results. So the primary outcome they measured was time uh, to death and survival times, and they they compared the survival times using a Kaplan Meier analysis. Um, they obviously took the baseline hemodynamics and the characteristics of the animals. There's 15 in total. Seven received methylene blue. Eight received norepi and they found that methylene blue is clearly not uh, superior to norepi um one out of seven of the animals in the methylene blue survived to 300 minutes so only 14 percent um 300 minutes which is one and then two of eight in the norepi group survived the full 300 uh, minutes so it's 25 percent survival uh the mean survival time in the methylene blue group was 100 minutes and then the mean survival time in the norepi group was 177 minutes, so uh, 77 minutes longer uh, uh, mean survival time in the norepi group. Uh, this wasn't statistically significant, however. Um, so, you know, in the discussion, the authors talk about, you know, methylene blue obviously didn't perform better than good old uh, norepi in this case. Um, the authors went on to, you know, still recommend high dose in uh, insulin therapy. Um, they also argue that this obviously, you know, it's it, Calcium channel blocker overdose is, is difficult and there's probably a multifaceted approach um, with some targets, some treatments targeting the cardiovascular function and then something else treating the, the decreased vascular resistance. Um, so, you know, they, they argue that previous case reports using methylene blue are a bit difficult to interpret because the treating physicians usually use calcium, high dose insulin, norepi, and, you know, where methylene blue adds in there as an adjunctive therapy as opposed to obviously just a single therapy. Uh, a little bit difficult to evaluate, but wasn't uh, wasn't promising in the pig model, anyways. So uh, two trials with kind of two different outcomes. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's good because you know you could certainly read the first trial and go, "Wow, this is great." Look, worked in mice. Let's just take the big jump up to humans and try it out. But that's why you have to do like science and in increments. Um, in the porcine model, it, it, it didn't really perform it perhaps a little worse than norepi, which is our standard treatment. And again, by the time somebody in real world use thinks of using methylene blue, it's usually after multiple pressors and maybe high dose insulin, maybe even intralipid, maybe even other therapies as well. So, I mean, the best you can say from the second study is it's, it's probably not statistically inferior to just sticking with norepi, but trend-wise, it's certainly norepi would probably more likely get you resuscitated. So um, not the end of where we are with methylene blue, because of course we're gonna use it, someone's gonna use it somewhere in human cases. And to tell us a little bit about those, I'm gonna jump over to our Fox fellow, Matt. Good afternoon. So I have two cases um, to talk about, and I'm gonna run through both cases and just summarize the discussion together since they're uh, I think it would be more more straightforward. So the first case um, is a patient who came in and overdosed on amlodipine, which is dihydropyridine um, calcium channel blocker. When they arrived, their blood pressure was in the 60s over 30s, heart rate was in the 40s. The patient had suffered two cardiac arrests while being initially treated. Her um, initial treatment regimen included the typical things we start for most calcium channel blockers, including fluids, calcium. They were even started on glucagon and high dose insulin therapy. On top of that, they were started on triple pressure therapy, including norepinephrine, dopamine, and vaso. Despite that, they were still hypotensive, so they were paced transvenously and uh, they resuscitated them through these two cardiac arrests. And only after all that had essentially failed, did they start the patient on a methylene blue um, bolus and an infusion over the, over the um, 
next period of time. And shortly thereafter, after the methylene, methylene blue was started, the blood pressure significantly improved to the 110s over 60s, and you're able to pretty rapidly down titrate the pressors. And after a few days in the hospital, the patient was successfully extubated and was discharged from the hospital. The second case involved an overdose and non dihydropyridine um, calcium channel blocker, dotiazan, which was an extended release formulation. Um, this person had also taken promethazine and trazodone on top of this. When they arrived at the ER initially, they were stable given that the um, dotiazan was an extended release formulation with a heart rate in the 110s and a blood pressure in the 130s over 60s. But then over the ensuing hours, their blood pressure dropped pretty rapidly and profoundly, and they got severe refractory hypotension, despite, um, again, usual therapy, including calcium, glucagon, insulin. Their pressure choices in this case were phenylephrine, epinephrine, and vasopressin. And despite all of this, the patients, and in pretty rapidly escalating doses, um, the patients remained re uh, relatively hypotensive. So, about 11 hours into this patient's um, journey in their emergency department, they, they were started on just a, just a methylene blue bolus, um, and pretty rapidly thereafter as well, their norepinephrine requirements dramatically came down, as well as the other pressure requirements, and eventually their blood pressure improved as, all, as well, and they survived this um, pretty scary and harrowing um, overdose. Interestingly, in this case, the patient with, with the dotiazam, even though we usually associate it with um, depressed cardiac contractility, um, their heart rate and, and uh, EF looked relatively normal for their echo, and it was mainly the auditory, and their, rash, their, their explanation was that the uh, promethazine and trazodone might have contributed to the tachycardia and the preserved EF just from a lack of any afterload. Um, but generally, when we talk about calcium channel blocker overdoses, although I'm loaded peen and like the fetipine are typically more vaso, vasoplegic in, in a therapeutic dosing, and the um, dotiazam and uh, verapamil affect more cardiac contractility and uh, chronotropy. In overdoses, you generally, generally lose the selectivity and you kind of affect both your vasculature and your heart function, um, that's, which is why most patients will get bradycardic and hypotensive overall with a depressed EF. So the, the question in this case was like, what kind of like, how do, do the, um, does methylene blue help treat these patients' overdoses? And the interesting, interesting thing is that although we typically learn that calcium channel blockers block these L-type calcium channels and inhibit um, smooth muscle cardiac contractility and baseline base vascular tone through a direct effect of the calcium channels, um, they've also been found to um, increase nitric oxide synthase through um, uh, um, through like enzymatic um, activity and they lead to in increased nitric oxide activity at baseline. This nitric oxide binds to guanocyclase, which then converts GTP to cyclic GMP, which leads to vasodilation. So it's kind of like this cas intracellular cascading process that, that is also mediated through calcium channel blockers. Although they all do this, um, I think amlodipine is typically one of the ones that are associated with the most um, nitric oxide activity, but they all do lead to this. And the interesting, interesting thing, like, which I think underlies the treatment mechanism for all this, is that methylene blue, on top of its normal treatment um, effects from when someone has um, that hemoglobinemia, it has also been found to inhibit guanocyclase. And through the inhibition of this guanocyclase nitric oxide um, molecule, you prevent formation of cyclic GMP, and the formation of cyclic GMP leads to essentially uh, an increase in your relative vascular tone. So in cases where you have an excess of nitric oxide and GM, uh, uh, cyclic GMP activity, you're essentially counteracting all the effect of all this nitric oxide, and you're fixing the hypotension to get to a more normal blood pressure as well. Interestingly, on top of this, methylene blue also acts as a nitric oxide scavenger, so you're directly binding up this like, molecule that leads to this downstream cascading effects. And there's evidence that methylene blue as well increases catecholamine sensitivity through unclear mechanisms. And uh, overall, methylene, methylene blue is pretty safe. I mean, there's aside from tinging your all your secretions a blue color. There are reports and patients who are susceptible that you can get hemoglobinemia from methylene blue and cause hemolysis. These are pretty uncommon. And you need pretty high doses as well to get this. And generally, a bolus or a, a bolus and a low dose infusion doesn't generally cause this. And really, the patients that are 
at risk of it are those with G6PD deficiency, which is a pretty small subset of the population in general. So um, overall, the, the risk of adverse effects from methane in blue are, are not expected to be really prevalent. But I think it's interesting, interesting that despite this specific medication having very clear um, pathophysiologic mechanisms for helping treat vasodilation that's eff affected from calcium channel blockers, it's not as widely used. Yeah, so I mean, it's good to uh, review of the physiology while well, this would work in the first place. We often think of methylene blue, its original purpose is to treat that hemoglobin. Emia, we really don't think about its nitric oxide effects. So uh, there is you know, a reason similar to hydroxycobalamin why we might uh, want to use it in a couple of case reports. Uh, again, increasingly being published and presented as abstracts with calcium channel blockers, are most of the dihydrocurdine group, which are the most vasodilatory drugs, but these are not the only ones where it's creeping into our armamentarium. So to tell us about two other drugs that were overdoses where methylene blue was tried, um, it may not make intuitive sense, but uh, we'll discuss that. Uh, our UBC uh, emergency medicine Resident Brendan will tell us about one case of ketiapine and one case of metformin where these were used. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, as Sam said, my two cases center around the use of methylene blue for refractory distributive shock. And uh, <clears throat> notable in comparison to Matt's presentation, these are not in calcium channel blocker uh, overdoses. Um, the first is in uh, quetiapine overdose, and the second is in uh, glycoside and metformin overdose. Uh, I'll talk about the cases first, and then I'll get into uh, a little bit how methylene blue works and why the authors think that uh, it probably it probably should be used a little bit more often than it is. Um, keeping in mind that uh, both Brad and Matt have already just given talks on how it works, so I'll try and be be brief and uh, not repeat myself. Uh, so the first case is out of Australia. Uh, it's a case report on a 41-year-old uh, male with a history of epilepsy and bipolar disorder who presented two hours uh, post large ingestion to the emergency department. Uh, significant ingestion, uh, 18 grams of extended release quetiapine, 10 grams of controlled release carbamazepine, 200, 240 milligrams of fluoxetine, 35 grams of enteric coated valproate and 355 milligrams of oxazepam. Um, so not surprisingly, this patient presented initially GCS3, but was in fact hemodynamically stable. Um, uh, he had a, a slightly long QRS of 120 and, and a long QTC of 536. Um, he was promptly intubated uh, and an NG tube was placed and he had 50 grams of activated charcoal uh, that was put in. Um, over the next four and a half hours, however, he became progressively um, more shocky uh, and unstable uh, despite four liters of fluids. And so uh, vasopressors were started uh, at rapidly escalating doses. Uh, he was on uh, norepinephrine, vasopressin, uh, dopamine, as well as metamorphinol which I don't think is actually used very often in, in Canada. No, um, it's not none of the U.S. either. It's an, a pure alpha agent, though. Just for, yeah. yeah. Um, it was deemed that the patient was more in distributive shock based on their echo findings. Um, and despite the best uh, or optimizing vasopressor use uh, for the next 12 hours, he remained hypotensive and unable to achieve a, a MAP of 65. Um, and so the decision 12 hours post ingestion uh, was made to give a trial of methylene blue. And so a loading dose of 1.5 milligrams per kilo was given and then an infusion uh, for the next 12 hours uh, that was slowly tapered. Um, and impressively, uh, there was a really significant improvement in the hemodynamic patient's hemodynamics within an hour. Uh, so within one hour, uh, he was off vasopressin, metamorinol, and uh, dopamine. And the levo was brought from 100 down to 30, um, and then down to five after uh, five hours. So really significant improvement in the um, hemodynamic parameters. Um, it was deemed that 
the hypotension was most likely related to the quetiapine as they got a quetiapine level that was uh, 18,600 nanograms per milliliter, which is several hundredfold greater than a therapeutic dose, um, which has been known to cause kind of alpha 1 antihistamine and alpha blockade. Um, so that is the first case. Uh, the second case is uh, somewhat similar. Uh, it's a 44 year old male uh, with a history of type 2 diabetes and, and uh, um, some other not super relevant medical history uh, who was on metformin glycoside uh, in the community. Uh, he presented in somewhat of a delayed fashion after a significant overdose on his uh, glycoside and metformin in a suicide attempt. He took 2.1 grams of his glycoside and 35 grams of his uh, metformin. Um, and like I said, he presented um, a little bit of a delayed fashion. He took the uh, medications at night and then uh, didn't tell anybody about it for the next 12 to 24 hours um, when he started to develop some abdominal pain. So that's why he presented. Um, initially, he was uh, alert and oriented, um, but significantly acidemic. Uh, so he had a, um, he's hemodynamically stable, um, but his pH was 6.88 and his bicarb was 4. Uh, and he had a, a significant uh, lactate of 29. Um, his, his sugar also notably was a bit low at 2.1. Um, so he was um, uh, intubated and uh, transferred to the ICU and put on CRRT, renal replacement, uh, to help clear some of the, um, the lactate and help with the acidosis as he had developed a bit of an AKI uh, during his stay in ICU. Um, and while he was there, uh, he developed progressive hemodynamic instability um, that was thought to be made worse by his acidosis or his acidemic state. Um, he was on significant doses of uh, levofed, epi, and uh, vasopressin, uh, and even steroids were given, but yet they were not able to achieve a MAP of 55. Um, uh, so, similar to the last case, uh, the decision was made to uh, trial methylene blue. So, this time a loading dose of 2 milligrams per kilo was given and then an infusion at uh, 0.25 milligrams per kilo per hour for the next 20 hours. Um, and it wasn't quite as dynamic as the first case, but sig still a significant improvement in the blood pressure uh, such that they were able to half their dose of levofed. Uh, after eight hours and come off completely the vasopressin and epi. Um, the patient did get a little bit worse from a, a respiratory uh, standpoint, um, needing uh, significant FiO2 requirements um, and PEEP and actually was prone for a period of time, um, but luckily was able to avoid ECMO. Uh, and then by day two was actually quite a bit better. Uh, off pressors extubated by day six. Uh, and was sent to the ward by day nine. Uh, so pretty dramatic responses to methylene blue in these two cases. Of course, they're case reports, and it's you can't draw any cause out like uh, such to make it, there's no comparison, so you can't draw any causality. It's all association. Um, but uh, I just wanted to touch on a couple of points that Matt and Brad also brought up, which is that. Um, in a lot of distributive shock, there's thought to be an excessive nitric oxide signaling, whether it's sepsis or whether it's in a lot of other drug induced uh, um, hemodynamic instability. Uh, specifically with metformin, there's thought to be uh, stimulation of the nitric oxide synthase, which of course is going to make that hypotension worse. Um, and so methylene blue helps with this as it inhibits uh, nitric oxide synthase as well as downstream. Um, effects of nitric oxide, which is a guanylyl cyclase. Um, and so that's how vasodilation is mediated. Um, and so you could see why treatment with this uh, medication would help improve your SVR. Um, potential adverse effects, I know Matt kind of brought some of these up already, but there's a um, couple of other ones I thought of. Blue discoloration of the skin, urine, feces. Um, he mentioned hemoly hemolysis in patients with G6PD. Um, one other thing I think it's important to state, especially when we're talking about tox and, and 
potential suicide attempts is um, that methylene blue is also a strong monoamine oxidize inhibitor. And so you should really exercise caution when um, treating patients with potential who have been on antidepressant medications due to the risk of serotonin crisis, serotonin syndrome. Um, but otherwise, I, uh, it's from the last six papers, I suppose it's, uh, you wonder if there's more of a role than we're giving methylene blue. Yeah, so slowly building the case for, you know, clearly the vasodilators, but these I thought were too novel. Uh, Overdoses. I mean, quetiapine makes some sense because there is vasodilatation and metformin. Less so, this may be an acidosis induced um, shock state. So, uh, it generates lactic acidosis type B, which then generates lactic acidosis type A from shock and itself. Um, so, and we always have the same issue that comes up. We'd like to get them dialyzed, but we can't get the pressure up high enough to get them on the dialysis machine. So, maybe something like methylene blue might be useful, and of the two, the one that's less likely to interfere with the dialysis, uh, you know, uh, putting them on the machine is the methylene blue, even though it turns things blue, it doesn't cause the machine to turn off because it detects a blood leak like the hydroxycobalamin does, which turns everything red and makes everything look like there's blood in your serum where it shouldn't be. So, I'm not sure we're going to answer the question, but we're going to try with the next uh, paper. Um, and there's another one talking a little bit about you alluded to the serotonin uh, syndrome. So our UBC uh, emergency medicine resident Sean is going to tell us about not exactly a head to head prospective study, but at least a comparison of the two. Go ahead, Sean. All right, so I've got uh, my first paper is. Uh... Hydroxycobalamin versus methylene blue for vasoplegic syndrome in cardiothoracic surgery, a retrospective cohort. Uh, it's a 2020 study out of the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia. And uh, so, uh, vasoplegic syndrome, it's a, a life threatening condition as described in the perioperative setting um, in patients undergoing cardiothoracic or solid organ transplant surgeries may be as high as 5 to 25 percent in people who are on cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, and it's characterized by hypotension, low systemic vascular resistance, a normal or high cardiac output, and then significant vasopressor requirements. And so, the way it is generally treated is uh, with intravenous with volume and pressors, and then there's the alternative agents that we've kind of spoken about before, um, such as methylene blue and hydroxycobalamin, and they're used for for kind of rescue therapy with this um, syndrome. And so people have already went over the mechanisms, so I'm going to skip that. Um, but little is known whether which of these drugs is, is better in this context. And so that's what they kind of wanted to, to look at to, um, with their small cohort study. And they hypothesized that hydroxycobalamin would be, would uh, decrease pressors and increase MAP to a greater degree than methylene blue, but they didn't really give a great justification for that. And so they did a retrospective cohort study. Um, it was done from 2015 to 2018 and was um, inclusion criteria was whether you got uh, hydroxycobalamin uh, or methylene blue in the cardiothoracic surgery uh, perioperative setting. And so, but you couldn't combine the two um, and you were ineligible if it was uh, basically any organ, like uh, another organ transplant, so it had to be cardiothoracic surgery. And the choice of methylene blue or hydroxycobalamin was up to the provider in this study. And so basically, they looked at uh, presser requirements, MAP, SVR, kind of an hour before the drug was given, and then up to six hours after the drug was given. Um, and for their primary outcome, they looked at the 
change in time average norepinephrine equivalence one hour after intervention. So they basically they um, took her pressor requirements, converted that into norepi equivalence, and then looked, uh, you know, an hour after the drug was given, did that change? Um, there's secondary outcomes, as I mentioned, they looked at uh, MAP, they looked at norepi equivalence, and they looked at SVR uh, just at different time points along that um, one hour before or six hour after uh, intervals. They also looked uh, at adverse outcomes and then uh, ICU free days, mechanical event free days, and mortality. And so for their results, uh, they had 35 patients in this cohort study, 16 on the methylene blue arm and 19 on the hydroxycobalamin. Uh, their mean age was 58 years old and 29% um, got an aortic repair, 26 got a cabbage and 20% had cardiac transplant. Looking at the severity, like the illness severity, the, the uh, methylene blue group was actually a little bit sicker. Um, in terms of how they actually got the drugs, uh, the average dose of methylene blue was 1.2 milligrams per kilogram per dose, and majority got that as a bolus. Um, some got it as an infusion, and one patient got a bolus and infusion. And then the hydroxycomalbin was given the standard five grams uh, over 15 minutes. And so, kind of as Zane alluded to, unfortunately, they didn't really find much. Uh, difference between these drugs and their outcomes. So for their primary outcome, that was the change in time average norepi one hour after administration, um, there was no difference uh, between, there was no difference basically um, in norepi um, between groups or prior to when the drug was given, which is super, which is very interesting. Um, when you went on to their secondary outcomes, both methylene blue and hydroxycobalamin increased the MAP um, after the drug was administered. Um, and they did this, the hydroxycobalamin increased it um, at kind of the 50 minute mark, the 30 minute mark and an hour and four hours, but not two hours after and the hydroxycobalamin um, sorry, the methylene blue increase it over every time point uh, uh, up to six hours. Um, and then when you went uh, looking at norepi requirements um, at the various time points, uh, methylene blue was not associated with a decreased norepi requirements at any time point over the six hours. Uh, but the hydroxycobalamin was at one hour and four hours after administration. Um, then when they looked at, once again, the maps over those six hours, comparing the two drugs, basically there was really no difference between the maps of the various of the two drugs, besides at 30 minutes before the drugs were administered and 15 minutes after um, is where hydroxycobalamin had a slightly higher map, but once again, the people in the methylene blue group were, were a sicker cohort, so I have to take that into, into context. When we're looking at SVR, similar to, to Brendan's paper, um, both agents are, are associated with an increase in SVR one hour after administration, but no difference between methylene blue and hydroxycobalamin. And finally, in their uh, the last of their secondary outcomes, there was no difference in terms of uh, time, time-free ICU, uh, time-free on, on the vent, and no difference in mortality. And then they um, did not report any adverse events in either group. And so I think for this paper, I guess the the conclusion would be that both drugs did increase MAP, they increased SVR, they didn't really change norepi uh, dosages, and there was no real difference between the two drugs. And it's also difficult to compare this in that uh, the methylene group 
blue group was thicker, uh, and you have a retrospective study where it's not controlled who's getting um, which drug. And so I agree with their conclusion that they need, you need a prospective study to look at this so you can make uh, some firm conclusions. Yeah. So, I mean, it appears both are helpful. Uh, and again, this is not overdose situations, but surgical uh, uh, theater problems of vasoplegia. So, not exactly what we're looking at, but both seem to work, although the two arms of the study weren't matched, methylene blue were sicker than the other one going in. And so, you know, what does it all mean? Uh, part of it may be just be is you have to pick your case carefully, like who has the bigger contraindication to one of the other uh, drugs. And so one of those is you don't want to do it or you might precipitate serotonin syndrome. So tell us about your other paper where that indeed we always allude to that, but that happened. Yeah, so my second uh, second paper is vasoplegic shock treated with methylene blue complicated by severe serotonin syndrome. And so this is a 2018 study in the Journal of Medical Toxicology. Um, and so this is a case report of a 15 year old male um, who basically had a polysubstance overdose, got some methylene blue for, um, for vasoplegic shock and then developed serotonin syndrome. And so, he has a past medical history of hypertension and a major depressive disorder. And he developed distributive shock 1.5 hours uh, after an overdose on his own medications and um, really large doses of these. So quetiapine sustain release, 1.5 grams. Uh, quetiapine immediate release, 12 grams. Desvenlafaxine sustain release, 5.6 grams. Venlafaxine, 1 gram. Amlodipine 290 milligrams, Ramipril 100 milligrams, Fluoxetine 560 milligrams, Promethazine 500 milligrams, and an unknown amount of lithium. And so he has quite severe shock uh, despite fluids, calcium, uh, norepinephrine at two mics per kilo per minute. And he weighs 70 kilos, so that's 140 mics per minute, so big doses. Uh, and vasopressin at seven units per hour. Um, and so that would be 0.11 units per minute, which is what I'm more familiar with dosing it at. He has a bedside echo during this, uh, reveals a hyperdynamic heart. And so six and a half hours post ingestion while he's on rocket fuel, he gets uh, a dose of methylene blue because he still has a map of 48 despite being on those medications. And so they give him a bolus of 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, followed by an infusion of 1.5 milligrams per kilogram for, uh, for 12 hours, and then one milligram per kilogram per hour for uh, the next 12 hours. And within one hour, his uh, shock state improves and his vasopressor requirements decrease. So uh, they put his norepi down from two mics per kilo per minute to 0.6 mics per kilo per minute. And his vaso goes from seven units per hour to 2.4 units per hour. So pretty profound uh, change. Unfortunately, 12 hours post-ingestion, um, he develops serotonin syndrome that lasts about five days. And so they initially note that he gets fixed dilated pupils, uh, starts to be hyperthermic at 38.5 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, he also has a normal CT scan at that time. Uh, he's sedated and paralyzed with uh, fentanyl, which is a bit of a no, uh, medaz, and then rock infusion. And he's also given Kepra 1 gram for seizure pro prophylaxis. He becomes progressively hyperthermic, increased tone rigidity in the lower limbs, and sustained ankle clonus. And so from that, um, meets the 100 criteria for serotonin syndrome. And he's managed with active cooling and ongoing paralysis with rock uranium infusion uh, for five days post his overdose. Uh, unfortunately, he also develops a VAP, uh, but then is uh, extubated on day seven and makes a complete recovery. Um, so we've heard about methylene blue. Um, in terms of serotonin syndrome, how 
it happens. It's a uh, MAOI inhibitor. Um, and in this context, I think these are very muddy waters to this person may have gotten serotonin syndrome without getting uh, the methylene blue, um, but it likely interacted uh, with those above medications in terms of his, you know, fluoxetine, desvenylfaxine, venlafaxine, uh, quetiapine. Um, and in terms of when we see serotonin syndrome, um, at least that's what these authors claimed is uh, SSRIs and SSNRIs can produce a mild to moderate, but when then when you um, add uh, an MAOI can cause much more severe effects. And I think the paper that I covered uh, last week on serotonin syndrome uh, is an MAOI, which caused the majority of the fatal serotonin syndromes in, in Europe. Um, and this has been uh, reported in the literature uh, with serotonin syndrome, or sorry, with methylene blue causing serotonin syndrome um, when it's used as a surgical dye or in cardiac surgery. Um, but this is the first time that it's been uh, reported uh, in when it's been used for vasodilatory shock that's been associated with a toxicological cause. And so they were saying that uh, you, if you're worried about serotonin syndrome in someone with vasodilatory shock associated with tox, um, you could use lower dosage or a shorter infusion um, to decrease that risk. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, you know, good. A lot of times we, you know, say, oh, serotonin syndrome, we could probably always deal with that. And, and they did uh, deal with that, but it ended up like a, almost another week in the hospital. I mean, we can Monday morning quarterback about whether or not he should have been continued on fentanyl for sedation after getting methylene blue. I know we often advise that to stop that, which is probably good advice. But then again, he took all these other drugs that are serotonergic, like venlafaxine and desvenlafaxine um on top of his calcium channel blocker um so maybe not the best pick maybe in a scenario like this maybe this is one where hydroxycobalamin might have been a um the sort of vasoplegic rescue uh of choice so those are the two choices we have off label again i stress uh for uh vasoplegic shock uh, mostly calcium channel blockers, but we see it can happen in other drug overdoses as well. And I think you have to decide which is the lesser of two harms as far as what are the drugs they took or what are the medications you need or whether or not they need uh, hemodialysis or not. So with that, we'll take a little breather away from vasoplegia and talk about one of our always favorite topics, which is acetaminophen. And we're going to go to our new triple play, our new uh, for cinnamon overdose. So we have two articles addressing that um, with our Tox fellow, Jen. Yeah, so I have um, two sort of comparative case reports um, of patients who were treated uh, with this um, quote unquote triple therapy for massive acetaminophen overdoses, and that therapy is our sort of standard therapy of n acetylcysteine uh, for methylpyrazole, which more of us know more familiarly as uh, um, and some sort of extracorporeal um, uh, treatment. Um, in one case, it was hemodialysis, and the other it was primarily CRT. Um, and I think it is interesting to sort of compare the two um, at the end I think our question in applying this triple therapy really centers around who's the right patient population um, for this uh, group of therapies. Um, I'm not sure either of the case reports answers the question for me, so we can talk about it later. Um, so the first one is out of um, the group um, at Lehigh Valley uh, Health Network. Um, is a case report of massive acetaminophen poisoning treated with novel triple therapy, and acetylcysteine for methylpyrazole and hemodialysis. Um, and the um, the way that the authors bill this case um, is that um, the paper uses a novel approach. It represented at the time it was published in 2019 um, the fourth highest acetaminophen concentration reported in the literature of a surviving patient um, and the first report of administering 
uh, Femepazole um, in successful management of patient with asthma in toxicity. So this is a 64-year-old lady with no known past medical history who ingested 208 tablets of acetaminophen, 500 milligrams of diphenhydramine, 25 milligrams, about three hours prior to her arrival in the ER. She was intubated in the field due to her altered mental status, vomiting and um, poor respiratory effort. Um, of note, uh, when she arrived at the ER, um, it said that she had almost maybe like a little bit of a hypertensive blood pressure of 139 over 102, but then became hypotensive and received five do push, dose of, push doses of epinephrine and then placed on a dopamine and a norepinephrine infusions. Um, her notable findings on her EKG were a slightly widened QRS at 112 and a QTC of 659, um, which is later explained by the UDS that detects methadone, um, although it didn't come up with methadone in her mass spec, so that might not be a, it might, yeah. Um, I don't know, I couldn't really explain the QTC, but um, she has an initial elevated lactate, um, AST was 21 and ALT that's slightly elevated at 99, um, and initial blood gas to pH is actually not bad at 732, but she has a bicarb of 6. And her initial acetaminophen concentration is 1,017. Um, and she is treated with uh, IV bicarb, IV NAC. She's given a bolus dose of methazole at 15 mg per kg. Um, and they use the phrase immediate hemodialysis, um, which was actually started 10 hours after her ingestion. Um, or no, sorry, 10 hours after her arrival. So I don't, I don't know. Um, not it's sort of maybe immediate, um, but um, they uh, trended her acetaminophen concentration. Um, they note that during her hemodialysis, her NAC uh, rate was uh, doubled so that she got 200 mg per kg and then tripled up to 300 mg per kg and they did give a second dose of um, femepazole um, at 10 mg per kg um, during uh, hemodialysis. Um, and she ultimately was transferred to a liver transplant center where she con was continued on IV NAC and received additional hemodialysis, although she did not receive any additional doses of femepazole. Um, and uh, eight days following her ER presentation, she was uh, discharged to an inpatient psychiatric unit in a reportedly normal state of health. So um, I think that things that are sort of notable um, in uh, this case report um, are I think just the timing of the therapies, they have a really nice figure um, in figure two where they sort of map out her acetaminophen concentrations um, and when she received various therapies. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious in looking at this that, you know, between the time that hemodialysis starts um, and five hours later, you know, presumably she ran about a four to five hour course of hemodialysis. Um, there's a significant drop in her uh, serum concentration from 825 to 299 or like between 400 and 200. So I think it, you know, the hemodialysis makes some very impressive change here. Um, I think that the time interval um, between the administration of the semeprazole and the start of hemodialysis is only three hours um, and it's, there's no interval serum concentrations. Um, so it's hard to kind of interpret, you know, I guess the, the, the 4MP is blocking the um, metabolite formation, but I, I feel like if you're going to start hemodialysis, like I don't really know if the 4MP like adds much to the, the picture um, if you're going to just clear the offending agent um, because by removing that much of it, you're going to prevent the downstream effect anyway, if that makes sense. Um, so I think it's just hard in this context to interpret 
how the core methylpyrazole really adds to the um, uh, overall treatment regimen um, based on just looking at uh, like acetaminophen concentrations. Um, you know, if we're looking at the fact that she, I guess, didn't need transplant and they don't really say beyond like her initial LFTs, but her LFTs were later, like, you know, um, you know, if the outcome is mortality and, and liver injury and not needing a transplant, like maybe it helps by adding, I don't, I don't know that we can really deduce that from this uh, anyway, but either, but um, it's interesting nonetheless, it's great that she survived because that's always that one you're looking for um, without transplant. But um, I think honestly, if I had gotten this call, I probably would have just tried to push up hemodialysis as early as possible, like given that high serum concentration that they got at two hours, I just would have maybe thrown those other things at her, but tried to get dialysis started earlier than 10 hours after her arrival. It's sort of my um, thought process behind it. Um, and the second case report um, is a very different patient. Uh, so this case was a 24-year-old uh, brought into a community hospital um, with altered mental status, um, and they later obtained the history that she ingested 50 grams of acetaminophen, 25 grams of gabapentin, and 60 milligrams of morphine, and her estimated time of ingestion was 16 hours prior to her arrival. Um, in addition to being um, her, I guess, I mean, I didn't have a chance to look this up, um, but with a, because this is a Canadian report, um, they are reported in uh, micromoles of acetaminophen. Um, is that equivalent? No, Rob's shaking his head. Okay. No, I don't think that's equivalent. It's a high level. It's it's not equivalent to three thousand. You know, a certain level that we would. It's bad. Pretty high. Uh, maybe someone okay. will do the conversion for Does us. Does anybody know a conversion? Yeah. Rob, maybe can help me. Okay, anyway, so she had a very high initial acetaminophen concentration. Um, she had a lactate of about four. Uh, she was acidotic with a pH of 7.2 and a bicarb of nine. Um, she also was treated with N acetylcysteine, um, got a single bolus, and then an infusion of 12 mg per cake per hour afterwards as well as um, a dose of IV fomepazole. Um, and like I said, her two hour concentration was very high um, and she was transferred to the ICU. Um, and uh, later in her um, clinical course, um, she uh, was um, started on uh, intermittent hemodialysis, um, mostly for the worsening of her acidosis um, and that was started about 58 hours after her initial ingestion. Uh, she got two, uh, one four hour run and then one six hour run of hemodialysis, um, at which point she was actually switched over to CRT um, and started on CRT, uh, which was ongoing. Um, of note, um, while they made a pretty Substantial decrease in her acetaminophen concentration uh, with the hemodialysis on CRT. She sort of plateaued. Um, they make note of that in the paper um, that despite being on uh, CRT, she sort of had this elevated acetaminophen concentration. Um, they even did like whole bowel irrigation and tried to do decompression um, of her ileus. Um, and it wasn't until post ingestion day eight that her on on CRT for seven days that her acetaminophen was undetectable. Um, she unfortunately uh, developed pretty profound cerebral edema and some hemorrhage, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, um, and uh, she had an MRI that showed basically diffuse axonal injury and um, her uh, care, goals of care were um, adjusted per her family um, and she died. Um, so, 
this patient I think is different from our previous patient in a few ways. Um, one is that she's a very delayed presentation in terms of her ingestion. Um, in, she's 16 hours post ingestion. Our other patient was um, three hours, three hours post ingestion. Um, I think the other component to this um, is that the co ingestion of the morphine, maybe some role of the gabapentin. Um, I don't know if that, it seems to have modified her absorption of it. Um, in that sense that she had such a high concentration, um, 16 hours out, and I wonder if there was a component that um, sort of contributed to maybe the plateau um, that they reached despite being on CVVH, like if there was some gut um, slowing that caused her to sort of still have, or, or if the massive amount formed some sort of fees or that then sort of sat around and stuck around that she was continuing to absorb that they couldn't get her to an undetectable concentration until uh, day nine. Um, so um, I think the things that are really interesting about the paper, again, are sort of this role of um, hemodialysis and trying to move in these large cases towards some sort of extracorporeal removal um, early um, or as soon as possible um, seems to not necessarily change the, well, not change the clinical outcome in this case, but does seem to be the thing that really modifies the concentration the most. Um, and again, sort of if you're looking at the outcomes of like transplant or mortality or failure and you, the use of your NAC plus your 4MP, I think it's again hard to assess how much the 4MP is really adding to the NAC um, when you have two cases where the outcomes are very divergent uh, in the end. So um, I'm curious to know what other people think. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're going to do interventions, aggressive interventions for really high levels, and I did just sort of thumbnail, thumbnail calculation on that initial acetaminophen level, it's probably in the 500 range rather than like the thousand range as it was in the first paper. Mm -hmm. um, but they did wait until 58 hours after ingestion before they did IHD, which stands for intermittent hemodialysis. Um, I think that's what they wanted to say in the first paper, not immediate hemodialysis, but some copy editor maybe changed it from immediate to from <laughs> say, what they like What they wanted was intermittent. So it's a little confusing there. But right, if you're going to do, you know, if someone comes in with a high level and they're acidotic, you know, they're, they allude to the extra recommendations of considering hemodialysis early before you wait and things aren't working. Um, and whether or not, or methylpyrazole, fomepazole buys you a little bit of time while you're arranging that, because all we all know sometimes they have to be transferred and things have to happen to make that happen. Maybe it does, but I guess neither of these two case reports honestly prove that because um, they both have very different outcomes and they're both different stories completely, which is why it's hard to do, I think, systematic review and all your review are lots and lots of cases without any good comparative studies. I don't know, Rob, any thoughts here? No, besides the, uh, sorry, I was a little slow on the units there. It's uh, 150, our 150 uh, micrograms per mil is 1,000 mm. millimoles. So let's see, conversion is divided by 6.7. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I wish I, I wish we had the answers here. I, it's, it's sort of exciting that there's a couple of different options for these very large overdoses. Um, you know, if I could make hemodialysis work like that, then that would be pretty straightforward. If we had evidence that 4MP unequivocally blocks the production of NAPI in large, in any, any overdose, much less in very massive overdoses, then I would be very, very pleased. Um, we don't have that yet. So we're yeah. kind of all struggling with, you know, I think. Hemodialysis removes the acetaminophen, 4MP blocks its um, 
you know, the production of NAFTA, it seems like they can kind of go hand in hand. Um, you know, and certainly if you're deciding to hemodialyze someone and it's going to be four hours, because it will be four hours between the time you make that decision and the time you actually put them on the um, circuit, then it seems like a reasonable thing to do in these situations. But we need more info for there to be a, you know, definitive word on this one, I think. Well, maybe what we should do is is what they did way back when the first article that you know we presented take some medical students and poison them, and then we can see if we can resuscitate them. But well, we have to actually move up to a higher, uh, you know, mammalian model, and therefore I think the only way to resolve this is by poisoning toxicologists. So, Courtney, tell us how we do that. Let me tell you about a couple of volunteers for a really great study. So the first article I have is the effect of femepazole on oxidative metabolism of acetaminophen in human volunteers. And this was out of the Journal of Medical Toxicology in 2019 from our colleagues in Phoenix. And the point of the paper was to sort of extend what previous studies have shown in mice and um, human hepatocyte cultures that femepazole decreases the toxic production of NAPGI, the toxic metabolite of acetaminophen and overdose, and to extend that to a human volunteer model um, by recruiting some of their friends, some staff and, and physician faculty um, to give them uh, therapeutic doses of uh, acetaminophen and doing uh, plasma and urine measurements. Um, and what they found was that it does extend to this model by decreasing the metabolites of the oxidative pathway in both the urine and plasma samples that they drew. Um, so the study was designed to uh, specifically look at the human volunteers ingesting single acute super therapeutic doses. So we'll just remember that um, as we sort of go through the way that they've set it up in their results. Um, so it's, it's not a toxic dose. Um, so the, the background of this paper, of course, is that, you know, but normally when we have our acetaminophen um, in our, our big overdose patients, we are concerned about the NAPKI formation and the CYP2E1 pathway. So that's what they're really focusing on with the femepazole in this case as an inhibition of that CYP enzyme to shunt the metabolite through other non-oxidative pathways that are less toxic or non-toxic. Um, so they have said you know, just to consider some special populations of acetaminophen overdose, which are either the massive overdoses, prolonged absorption, either with other co-ingestants or um, even in cases of uh, inadequate or unavailable NAC dosing, um, maybe we can prevent NAPGI altogether by inhibiting CYP2E1. Um, so what they did was they used a crossover trial method. So everyone is their own control um, and they took healthy, uh, greater than 18 years old, of course, but that sounds like this is like staff and faculty volunteers, um, people not taking any medications that affect acetaminophen metabolism, no history of alcohol, smoking, drug use, um, and they weren't allowed to drink or take alcohol within a specified uh, period before the study. Um, they have a, had a large list of exclusion criteria, which all makes sense, sort of pregnancy, lactation, history of allergy to femepazole or acetaminophen, anyone whose LFTs weren't within normal range, and then obese individuals with a BMI greater than 29, because um, what they had commented on was because obesity appears to increase the activity of CYP2E1, um, it could potentially uh, be a compounder to the study. So they ended up with five. They had six people, but it sounds like one of them broke the rules, so they had to be excluded from the um, from the results uh, component. So what they did was they randomized uh, each of the three um, uh, volunteers into two groups, um, starting with A or B as their treatment uh, protocol, or B to A. Um, treatment A started a single dose of acetaminophen that was 80 mg per kg, and that was given immediately after the first 30 minutes of a 4-MP infusion. So treatment B is the same dose of acetaminophen with two doses, 
at 15 megs per keg followed by 10 megs per keg, which is what we have used in the past for ethylene, or currently for ethylene glycol and methanol. And then what they did was they took blood collections uh, at one, two, three, four, six, eight, and then 24 hours, where time zero was the time of acetaminophen ingestion. And then they collected urine for a total of 24 hours. Um, they analyzed all these samples for several metabolites, um, both the uh, um, oxidative metabolites and the oxidative metabolites. So they're looking at uh, APAP glucuronide, APAP sulfate, APAP GSH, um, APAP NAC, APAP glucine, um, and then we'll go through uh, what they found, which is pretty interesting. They attempted to measure the uh, pro um, plasma protein adducts, but um, they ended up actually not finding any. And the primary outcome of all this data was the fraction of ingested acetaminophen excreted uh, as a total of the oxidative metabolite. So that would be the APAP cis, the APAP NAC, the APAP GSH, um, which should reflect the fraction of drug metabolized by the CYP2E1 pathway. So if we block that, we should be decreasing it. Um, so I can pull up the uh, figures here because they are. All right. So essentially, figures one through four um, are showing that though the overall absorption and uh, metabolism of acetaminophen is equal throughout both of these groups that are serving as their own controls, um, the uh, femepazole treated group has what looks like a shunted metabolism through the non-oxidative pathways. And that should be from the CYP2E1 in inhibition of the femepazole, decreasing the APAPSIS, APAPNAC, and the overall total. So that's like here on the here on the left. You can see this APAP group and then this APAP plus femepazole group here. And we have percent APAP excreted as the APAPSIS, APAPNAC, and then percent total oxidative metabolites. And that's a pretty dramatic difference um, between these the five uh, self-controls. And then on the other side, we have this unchanged acetaminophen that's excreted, this percent excreted as uh, the apap gluc, and then the apap sulf. And these are pretty much equal. This top right, you know, is meant to sort of suggest that the, the overall absorption of acetaminophen was the same, which is, you know, a, a good way to control for some things. And then also it sort of suggests that um, they didn't miss anything with the urinary metabolites. Like they have tried to account for everything that's been metabolized as a total to show that if you give femepazole along with the acetaminophen, then you have just shunted through another pathway rather than, you know, having a decreased uh, excretion overall. They do comment that they would have missed fecal excretion because they did not measure that. Um, so here is another graphical representation. This is the serial plasma concentrations of the apepsis and the apepnac um, in the two treatment groups. Um, so it's really interesting. So you can see how much lower this sort of blue dotted line is here with the femepazole uh, versus the acetaminophen alone. Um, and the, oh, I don't know why that's all highlighted, but um, and then in here we have the serial plasma concentrations of the parent drug in the top and then our uh, non-oxidative metabolites. So it's sort of sh showing that it's pretty similar. So the non-oxidative pathway stays pretty much the same. And then the plasma, uh, um, plasma concentrations of acetaminophen in general sort of follow the same trend between the patients. Um, and I think that uh, that is the end of the figures. Um, but it's a really interesting way, um, but again, remembering in a non-toxic dose of acetaminophen to sort of demonstrate that there is pretty good evidence that there's inhibition of the oxidative metabolism um, in this single, you know, super therapeutic but non-toxic dose um, that, you know, we can inhibit the CYP2E1 pathway with the meposol. And there were no adverse effects from it either, which was great. Um, the only thing that probably should be commented on is the limitations of the study. Obviously, this is a very small sample size for validation, but um, you know the point that they make in the paper is that it was adequately 
powered um, because the effect size was so large. Um, uh, and then also just to, to remember that our peak acetaminophen concentrations for these patients were like 120 at one hour and then at four hour we're 68. So that's where we were falling um, with our with our uh, serum concentration ranges when we just think about the way that it's metabolized and sort of the, the toxicity um, effects. So that was article number one. Yeah. So, I mean, a couple, well, just a couple of comments there because the other article is a little di different, but, uh, you know, I, I think it was a little bit of, of a gutsy uh, article to do, but I, you know, members of the group had done sort of the same sort of multi day Tylenol high doses to see if anyone develops liver failure previously. Um, so, 80 milligrams per kilogram is kind of below our, what would be our send in amount of, you know, 150 milligrams per kilogram. So, the good news is when they actually looked for, you know, adducts, nobody had them, whether they got treated or not. So they didn't really poison anybody. Um, there were eight authors and six subjects. My guess is one of the subjects wasn't Barry Rumac. The last thing you want to do is knock off Barry Rumac with Tylenol. It would just be a ridiculous concept. Um, but they were able to prove that you, you still have the same amount of uh, glucuronation and sulfonation as you usually see, but all these toxic to CYP2 E1 uh, metabolites, these uh, cysteines and whatever, uh, don't occur when you give promethazole. Now, again, these are lower doses, but it's highly suggestive that promethazole really does block that pathway. The question is, will it continue to block the pathway with really high overdoses? And that's, you know, what we really don't know, you know, because we don't even think of using this drug until someone comes in and like in the first studies, you know, Cinnamon levels of a thousand or something, but probably even lower than that, maybe five hundred. But I thought it was an incredibly novel idea to do this, and they have the ability to check these labs. Uh, Rob, any comments? Um, should we be doing this with our oxidology fellows, offering them two hundred dollars and poisoning them? <laughs> poisoning them? Uh, sure. <laughs> It <laughs> depends on how they did it in their in service today. <laughs> um, yeah, I, this is a great study. I I'm, I mean, this is I agree. It, it's we, what we what the next step is. You know, so they cleared, they they kind of proved the concept. The next step is is overdose patients, right? It's it's you know does it still block CYP two eighty one when you take you know. 15 grams or 20 grams or 50 grams and do you need to dose escalate or is uh you know the one dose the same and then i think the other thing that we the unfortunate part that we run into is that uh, a dose of femepazole is somewhere in the range of five thousand dollars um and i wish we didn't have to talk about this but we do so uh it's unfortunate so you know i <laughs> Listen, after seeing this study, I had these like these dreams of like, you know, every patient who has an overdose, just give them four MP and, you, you know, you're kind of done. Wouldn't it be wonderful? I don't know. Um, it would be. It's we're far from proving that yet, but this is a great first step. Um, I mean, this is a really exciting therapy as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And while the, uh, you know, maybe a little young to do a complete systematic review, because people have only been doing this for a few years, this next paper does attempt to do that. Um, I was just going to say, just limit the discussions. It's just a long paper just to the 4 MP part of the paper, because they talk about some other stuff there. So, Courtney, tell us uh, this one. Will do. They have a lot of uh, interventions for this. So. We will just talk about the femepazole, um, but the, the entire point of the article was to review the experimental and clinical data with several treatments for acetaminophen toxicity to see if that um, alone or in combination with NAT could be of benefit. So that's what we're looking at with the femepazole section. So, um, you know, as I had just mentioned with the last article, there's pretty good animal data that suggests that. 4-MP inhibits the CYP2E1 pathway with the potential to inhibit all of these toxic metabolites of acetaminophen. So, um, you know, currently it's expensive. We're only using it for ethylene glycol methanol, um, but it might be of, you know, some real utility in massive overdoses. So they sort of took a look back in all of the available data. Um, 
to summarize, so they have a couple of in vitro studies that they looked at. There were three of them. Um, they're in human hepatoma cells from human donors. Uh, and what they essentially did was expose them to acetaminophen, tried to provoke some kind of cellular damage um, or necrosis, and then added uh, the femepazole to see if they could inhibit any of those, those effects. And what the three studies found were adding uh, femepazole either reduced LDA leakage, LDH leakage, which was their marker of cellular dysfunction, uh, NACI, um, or ALT. One of the studies actually showed that acetaminophen treated cells release 40% of ALT into the surrounding medium. But then when you treated it with femepazole, it only released 10%. So that was kind of interesting. So those are sort of our in vitro um, studies. The next group of papers that they looked at were animal studies. And there were quite a few of these too. So just to summarize these, uh, the femepazole essentially in most studies prevented elevation of AST and ALT in the treatment groups. Um, in one particular group, um, they gave NAC and femepazole either together or in different doses, which was a, a different way than any of the other studies had done that. So um, just for example, they had given femepazole at 50 mg per kg, then femepazole at 200 mg per kg. Then they gave the femepazole plus the NAC um, and NAC alone as well. And that was the only study that did both of those things. Um, and what they found there was all of the antidote patterns uh, or combinations reduced the LFT activity and the degree of necrosis. But what they found was that combining the femepazole and the NAC didn't give any additional benefit over NAC alone. So that was number one. And then um, there's a, another paper that showed that the combination was better than femepazole alone, but not better than NAC alone. So all of these animal studies are essentially uh, re-demonstrating the central role of CYP2E1 in acetaminophen toxicity and is really highlighting the uh, role of femepazole in prevention and treatment um, of toxic metabolites and, and hepatic dysfunction. Um, the next set is a bit long and um, detailed, but essentially there's multiple case reports of humans. So now they've gone through in vitro, they've gone through their animal data, and now they're looking at all kinds of uh, case reports, case series, volunteer study that we just talked about um, in humans. And this is ranging from 2013 up through 2020. Um, and essentially what they've showed in all of these different case reports is that there are completely limited conclusions to all of this, aside from the paper that we just talked about, that sort of was a, you know, um, this crossover trial design specifically to control a lot of other factors. The other case reports are either of massive acetaminophen ingestions with obtundation, acidosis, consideration for dialysis, the doses of acetaminophen have at times been doubled based on the acetaminophen serum concentration or that the patient was undergoing some type of uh, CBVH or hemodialysis. Femepazole had been added in uh, most times out of concern that there could be a toxic alcohol that was sort of like in the differential when the patient presented with that clinical picture. Or in one case, it was added on out of concern that the acetaminophen uh, concentration was uh, either going to continue to be elevated or was elevated enough already to sort of predict a, a poor outcome. But then the femepazole dosing was also doubled in some cases because they were on dialysis. And there's a, a lot of confounding factors in all of these. The, there is an, a theme to them though, that it seems that where either by chance where they were thinking of a toxic alcohol or they had put femepazole on for a significant massive exposure that the patients tended to walk out of the hospital, um, it survived to discharge or had been discharged to the psychiatric facility and they didn't comment on anyone who had died. Um, 
But again, I don't think that we can make any conclusions from any of the human studies that we have because there's absolutely no controls there. And these patients were all very sick. So, unfortunately, the, our massive uh, ingestions that we really need to be looking at to assess the effectiveness of, of the femepazole, I don't think we're going to find in this particular case series from the human cases. So. Yeah. yeah, and then all the patients were all that sick, which is why it's hard to make you know, data from them. I mean, there's one article, they said six patients where they had levels like 130, 250, 283, 229, which are, doesn't really shock us other than, you know, that what we would normally do. So that's why we're doing these, let's compare everyone and see how they turned out. Well, a lot of those ones would turn out fine with standard therapy. But, yeah, I think it dips the toe in the water of this may be important and at least based on cellular and animal models and preliminary, as you say, human anecdotal cases, which are all subject to selection bias and what gets published um, seems promising. And the first study you presented probably is the most intriguing of them all, which is I can at least suppress the generation of the uh, oxidative uh, Toxins that come from 2v1. Any other thoughts on acetaminophen? I'm sure we'll probably have to sit down and decide amongst ourselves when are we going to actually recommend this or use this or, or think about using this. I, I don't think there's a number yet in anyone's mind. So I'm going to move on then. Uh, since we are running long, but I want to get everyone. I was looking, this is probably the most obscure repurposing of an antidote um, on the list today. And I'm going to turn this over to our fellow John to take about what we can do with deferioxidine. Um, the first article is A New Hope. I just wonder if that's like Star Wars, Obi Wan, Kenobi, you're our only hope, John. Yeah, uh, thanks, Zane. Um, yeah, th this is an article. Um, called the deferoxamine methylate a new hope for intracerebral hemorrhage from bench to clinical trials by Magdi Spellen. Um, and this is uh, some, just kind of some presentation of perhaps using um, deferoxamine for intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, through this article, they kind of talk about how there's a consideration of iron mediated neurotoxicity um, through hemoglobin degradation products from an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, and the time course for this is over the course of two to three days after the injury. And the thought is that, you know, if we can get deferoxamine to bind up the iron, we may not get the sequelae of, you know, a toxic hydroxyl radicals being formed leading to oxidative stress, um, activation of lipid peroxidation, and exacerbation of excitotoxicity. Um, so the in regards to the pharmacokinetics, um, you know, deferoxamine is rapidly absorbed and plasma concentrations do increase, you know, within minutes. Uh, the question is really whether it can get into the brain. And this paper does note that there's a supposedly a mechanism that there appears to be one of uptake by neuronal, neuronal cells. I looked up that study that they're referencing and uh, it was a rat study um, used to look at deferoxamine for intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, and they had a control of seven seven day old rats in which they looked at the serum and the brain concentrations of deferoxamine and the brain concentrations were able to get up um, you know to elevated concentrations um, and I think that's important because this is you know the blood brain barrier is a, a, a tricky thing to get around and it seemed that in that small subset of control patients you could get deferoxamine into the brain um, without any evidence of active ischemia. That was the control sample that had evidence of uptake. So there is some sort of uptake into the brain, which I think is important. Um, in terms of talking about the neuroprotective properties of the furoxamine, um, all related to binding of iron, um, there are multiple animal studies, uh, in vitro studies, um, kind of showing that there's de uh, decreased reactive oxygen species, as well as some in vivo studies um, looking at changes in optical nerve um, in rabbits um, after retrovolvo hematoma, and then um, a couple um, human studies that suggest an antioxidant protective effect, um, including patients with stroke. And it looks like this has been also referenced in 
um, reperfusion injuries and cardiac patients and prevention of damage to the myocardium by giving beforoxamine. So all in all, this, this, this paper is kind of, you know, a new hope, just raising the possibilities of beforoxamine and, you know, talking about some exciting things that could be happening from it, which kind of leads us to our second paper. I don't know if you had any comments on that. Particular. No, that was, that was just pretty much to set up why we would even think about doing this uh, if we did the second paper. Exactly. And now that this paper has me intrigued, we have the next paper out of the Journal of Neurotrauma in 2017. Um, and this is titled Effects of Defroxamine on Hematoma and Perihematoma Edema after Traumatic Intracerebral Hemorrhage. And so this was a um, study that was done. Um, I can't find the actual name of the, uh, it's the uh, Fudan University in Shanghai, People's Republic of China at the Huashan Hospital in neurosurgery. Um, and so what they did is they wanted to look at the um, difference in hematoma expansion of traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage, as well as the uh, edema, and see if there's a difference between patients who received defroxamine versus patients who did not. And they looked at multiple outcomes, both radiographically as well as clinical outcomes three months down the road in terms of Glasgow outcome scores. Um, this was a single center study, and uh, over three years, they included patients that were greater than 17 years admitted within eight hours after traumatic brain injury, only traumatic intracranial hemorrhage lesions seen on the head CT, um, a uh, relatively reassuring extracranial nerve injury scale of less than three. Um, and then the exclusion criteria were uh, any acute subdural, an epidural, or uh, an other, another mass lesion. So this is really trying to focus on the intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, if they had a Glasgow coma scale of three with bilateral fixed and dilated pupils, they were excluded. A known history of intracranial diseases, they were excluded. If they were thrombocytopenic or had decreased plasma fibrinogen, they were excluded. If they were on anticoagulants, they were excluded. If they had a quote unquote non survivable injury as deemed by the PI, they were excluded. Um, if they had, if they were taking iron supplements, they were excluded. They really kind of narrowed it down and wanted to find these patients that, you know, had a Initially, a kind of a re, uh, um, initially a good um, uh, Glasgow coma score and a good exam um, to involve these patients. And one of the interesting exclusion criteria was being on procloperazine, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. And uh, it turns out there's a couple case descriptions of people taking beproxamine and procloperazine inducing um, coma for three days from 1985. Which I had not heard of, but is some interesting defroxamine prochlorperazine syndrome someone's trying to describe. I'll have to read more about that maybe in another journal club. Yeah, they get severely encephalopathic. There was a case presented when we were at one of the Western Fellows conferences a year or two ago. So, yes, it's mm -hmm. one of those odd drug drug interactions. Um, so, going into this, um, you should note that this was not a um, randomized selection process. The uh, neurosurgeon, the trauma surgeon at the time, decided um, whether or not to give the patient deferoxamine or to put them in the control group. Um, and so, initially, the, the the groups were statistically significant in that the it, it seemed the control group was a little bit older. The um, the Glasgow Coma Scale was a little bit worse in the control group. And the INR was a little bit more elevated in the control group, and and um, the outcomes were a little bit worse with seven deaths versus one death, um, seven deaths in the control, one through the experiment group. They then did some propensity matching um, to make sure that there were no statistical differences in the um, selection cases. I did speak with a trauma surgeon the other day about propensity matching, and it seems to be one of the new fads, so to speak, in. Uh, trauma research and that if you do propensity matching it is very well received. Um, but I do want to point out that if you have biases going into the propensity matching, those biases will be carried forward. Um, so let's look at the actual data. Um, so kind of diving into this, um, they looked at, and I mentioned this was not blinded. The radiographic studies were blinded in terms of whether or not the patient, the, the people viewing the study, it was a control or a deferoxamine group. Um, 
the initial hematoma volume was 12.9 mils plus or, plus or minus 7 mils, and the initial edema volume was 3.1 mils plus or minus 2. Um, looking at the difference between the um, control group and the experimental group, um, they looked at the, the absorption of hematoma volume comparing the first day to the third day, seventh day, and 14th day, and they did that for edema as well. And um, the absorption of hematoma volume from the first to the third day and the first to the seventh day, it was statistically significantly different um, in the experimental group. But by the time they got to the 14th day, there, there was no difference between the control group and the experimental group in the, uh, hematoma absorption. Looking at changes of edema, um, comparing all different days from the first day to the third day to the seventh day to the 14th day, all of those, um, there was, there was um, much less edema in the control group, or excuse me, in the um, experimental group um, compared to the control group. Um, so there um, appears to be a difference in that from the from the deferoxamine. However, um, after matching and looking at these uh, all of these cases, they did do um, three month uh, outcome of Glasgow outcome scores between the two groups, and there was no significant difference in that. Um, so overall, these results suggest that deferoxamine may accelerate hematoma absorption in the short term, but doesn't it change the total absorption cycle. Um, and then looking at further outcomes, there didn't appear to be any long-standing differences in outcomes down the road. Um, so it, this is some interesting stuff that, you know, if you do decrease edema, are you tr actually saving, you know, some potentially damaged um, areas, um, such as like a penumbra, so to speak? Um, However, looking at the just the Glasgow outcome scores, there was no big difference between the two groups at three months. Um, and that's kind of the big takeaway point from this study. Um, I think that you know it, it it does show that there is there that deprocumin does appear to have an effect, um, at least in the short term, of hematoma absorption, and thereby uh, uh, the um, edema volume. Um, but in terms of what it's really, you know, it's overall outcomes, I'm not quite sure if it shows much. Um, interesting study, and I think that there's going to be more coming from this um, in the future. Yeah, no, I'm glad they tried to do some kind of, even though matching between the groups, because if you just, if they just published a case report like we were apt to do, I mean, you look at these CT scans, um, you go, wow, look at that, that giant hematoma just went away. And if you just did this as a single case report, but it's an interesting CTs, you think this is like a wonder drug, but they, they tried to match it up. And here was a similar CT, somebody who didn't get the drug and it got better, but there was a little bit more edema there. So um, interesting, uh, not sure we're gonna get called to ask about this, but I, uh, I think we should be aware, as you mentioned, don't give them proclomazine um, as an antiemetic. Um, because they get more encephalopathic if somebody is doing one of these trials somewhere. So with that, we've kind of run the gamut of some interesting uses of old drugs for new purposes. We're always being innovative or the world is always being innovative. And uh, otherwise, um, till next time, we'll uh, call it a day, a long day, but uh, certainly worth a listen for anybody who wants to hear that again. So for all we can.